Hello, everyone. Welcome to any uh, ritual seminar. Uh, my name is Jason Ho. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce the speaker of today's seminar, Dr. Vivek Rao. Dr. Rao joined the Advanced Reactor Engineering Group at Oak Ridge National Lab as a postdoc um, in 2018. Since then, he has worked in programs sponsored by the OE Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, such as ALPA-E and LLNLHPC4 Energy Innovation, while supporting design, modeling, and simulation activities at the Spallation Neutron Source, Building Technologies Research and Integration Center, and Materials Plasma Exposure Experiments, among other projects in applied CFD at Oak Ridge. Dr. Rao graduated with a PhD and a master's degree in chemical engineering from Missouri University of Science and Technology. And so uh, as always, uh, please, you know, you're encouraged to submit your questions through chat. And uh, also at the end, we'll have an opportunity for you to unmute and you can ask questions directly to Dr. Rao. Uh, with that, please join me to uh, welcome our speaker today. Vivek, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, glad to be here. It's uh, I think this is my first time presenting at NCSU. And uh, we, in the thermal hydraulics group, we've had, um, well, we were a team before, up until last year, and we were the advanced reactor engineering group, which is what I joined when I joined the lab. And then we had a major restructuring at the lab. And so a lot of the teams became groups and everyone's doubled in size. So our team of four people when I joined is now over 14 or 15 people. I think we have five postdocs in the group. When I joined, I was the only one. We're doing a lot of work across the board. And even though we're in the nuclear engineering side of the house, we get to use CFT across a broad, broad variety of applications and uh, over different platforms, different CPU platforms. We're in talks with the uh, vendors of these codes. So we're constantly looking for anyone who's uh, progressing in the GPU world. So some of this work is uh, the build up to what we, where we hope to be in five years from now. So that's what the title of the talk is, High Performance Computing and Thermal Hydraulics for Equipment Design and Process Development. Yeah, so uh, this is the layout of Oak Ridge National Lab. And there's almost so all these organizations you see in gray, which are uh, tabulated horizontally, they're directorates. And the directorates have divisions under them. And we sit in the uh, nuclear energy and fuel cycle division, which is in the fusion and fission energy and science directorate. So a big focus of this division is, uh, you know, nuclear fuel materials, reactor safety, uh, licensing codes, thermal hydraulics, and anything else that you can think of to do with the reactor design. Our sibling divisions are the fusion energy division and U.S. Eater, of course, which are closely related. And a lot of the staff in these divisions are also um, they bring a lot of interdisciplinary experience from the neutron sciences directorate, from commercial and nuclear companies, from uh, tier one vendors and suppliers, and people who've just you know uh, established a research expertise portfolio at the lab. So we we get to work on a multitude of projects, and being in a particular division does not restrict you to projects only in that division. So some of the work I'm talking about today is work that's been done for the Spallation Neutron Source, which now sits under the Neutron Sciences Directorate, and is also, uh, well, now we have the second target station project, which originally started off under the Directorate, but is now its own Directorate, and there's a lot of exciting work happening. Another point I'd like to make known is almost every single Directorate uses high-performance computing in one form or the other. And uh, oh, we have a dedicated ECP, the, the X scale computing project director now. And this is all a part of the reimagining of Oak Ridge National Lab that happened last year. And uh, I believe a lot of people from my division are also closely involved with NCSU. Um, some of them have been there through Castle, some of them have been in both the fusion vision side of uh, 
nuclear energy and it's just it's just a very small world so some of the work i'm talking about today is uh this is exclusively cfd applications that have used high performance computing that's been done at the lab uh, we do a lot of facility support and i've done a few projects for the spallation neutron source uh, the first one i'm going to talk about is uh, the target systems upgrade which is a part of the proton power upgrade project which is for the, the whole facility and upgrading the power of the proton beam. The second one is about uh, establishing a thermal map for the core vessel at the spallation neutron source. The third one was, was a project that came up from more of a, a safety related event, which led to a brief shutdown. And that's where CFD saved the day because uh, we were asked to go in and predict what would be uh, a safe operating level inside the mercury storage tank. So it's fun. Uh, there, there's some work that's been done in the SMR space that's closely relevant. And we also have some ancillary support systems uh, where we've done CFD designed to inform uh, procurement of equipment for molten salt pumps. And we also have some customers who reached out to us for some CFD analysis. Uh, the second major focus area is waste heat recovery, and this was a high performance computing project through Lawrence Livermore National Lab and a program that's managed by them called HPC for Manufacturing. This came out from the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. It's a mouthful, but it's at the Department of Energy, and uh, they're, they're the ones that sponsor the program and subcontracted through Lawrence Livermore. So we've had a lot of success through that program. And one of the projects was on waste heat recovery. We've completed several since then, but this is the only one that I'm talking about today. And the third topic is advanced heat exchangers. Drifts into the reacting flows uh, territory. So the target systems upgrade, uh, this is a map if, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, the Fellation Neutron Source. And generated uh, starting right from the front end to the actual target station. And the, the first target station is housed in a giant facility and there's uh, a lot of instrumentation for each one of these standalone facilities. And uh, now you can actually, and I think this is something that came out of the pandemic, but I didn't realize this until last week, you can actually do a virtual walk through the entire SNS uh setup and you can actually walk along the beam line and you can actually see uh where the superconducting fields come in where the beam is generated uh why different sections of the accelerator are significant what happens in the accumulator ring and all of this can be reached at the website it's open for public access uh, the target is down here by first target station and the new director for second target station is developing this entire facility right now one of the uh, major notable points is the first target station has a fixed target, but the second target station is a moving target, and that's something we're all excited to see. Uh, so CFD has been a big part of the target system operations. In the past, there have been issues uh, that have been outside the realm of uh, you know design and analysis, but mostly experimentally driven design. So. Uh, the target is uh, mostly comprised by stainless steel, at least the part that faces the beam, and is cooled by liquid mercury. Uh, the proton beam that's generated through the LINAC and the accumulator ring, which sort of concentrates the protons, uh, is pulsed at the target at about 60 times per second. And uh, there are several phenomena which now we know because of simulation and modeling efforts. Uh, our general workflow which go from you know, uh, CAD modeling experiments, uh, basic CFD simulations to get, a, to get an idea of peak temperatures, outflow temperatures, basic quantities, uh, you know, temperature velocity measurements, film heat transfer coefficients. Uh, that's been the traditional approach and that's been adopted for several targets in the past and recent years. Uh, we had the jet flow target, we have the blue target, uh, one of them is in operation right now as we speak and just finished a, an operating cycle. And the next target will be one of the targets which is very similar to what I'm talking about right here. Uh, so the, the, the main goal of the proton power upgrade project is to upgrade the power of the beam. 
So currently we operate at a one gig electron volt and it deposits about 1.4 megawatts of thermal energy in the target area, out of which about 60% goes to the solid and the rest is direct energy deposition, uh, deposition in the liquid mercury. And a lot of that must then be convected away by conjugate heat transfer. So we're trying to come up with a design, and this is actually a couple of years old, but it's an ongoing process. So some of the references noted below are really novel pieces of work where they've uh, looked into mitigation strategies to enhance the sort of the, the operating margin of targets. So the jet flow target has been the go-to design in recent years. And also to improve mixing, they've adopted uh, gas injection, and now they've also developed a gas liquid separator to keep the gas injection as a, a very feasible part of the target operating system. So the target is actually a part of a bigger loop, uh, the mercury process loop, which has a drain and storage tank uh, down here in the southeast corner of the diagram. Uh, you have heat exchangers which get the mercury up to the right operating temperature, and then there are pumps which regulate the flow rate through the target and back out. Uh, the target is situated out here right at the front, and that's where the proton beam impinges. So this is what the blue target looked like in a symmetry view of the 3D model. This is just a basic CAD model that was used for CFD analysis in the past. Um, you have liquid mercury that's injected down along the outer side where it comes in to a flow reversal volume. We call this the nose of the target. And it would basically be diverted out through the, the outflow return. And it, it's, it's a fairly complex design. So describing it in a two dimensional projection is a little difficult. But as you can see, there's a provision for gas injection line for uh, helium bubbles to be injected. Uh, there's a center baffle to divert the flow and also have regular mixing patterns. Uh, well, lateral mixing is a big issue. So the new design that they were looking at at the SNS was the CPU test target number one with a couple of uh, scaling modifications. One was the introduction of a bubbler. And this is downstream of the gas injection line. So if gases were injected, then you would have bubbled form uh, as a two-phase system. It's also beneficial if you just have single-phase flow going through the bubbler. Uh, and as you can see on the right from the top view, you have this convergent divergent mechanism which creates small oscillations in the lateral field, but that's enough to perturb the incoming axial flow. Um, the, in, the main inflow of mercury, uh, there'd be two driver side inlets and a single return line through the middle. And we also have a window inlet which has flow come in from the bottom. So you would have flow come along the bottom annulus, you would have flow along the driver side and both targets, and they would combine and exit through a single outlet. So habitation has been a big issue in the past. Uh, there's been some uh, brittle uh, structural issues, and it's a combination of effects because you have liquid metal flowing on the inside. So erosion, and cavitation are an issue. And then just over the course of um, the beam pulses impinging on the surface of the target on the nose, you have crack propagation among other things. So to look at these things, we, we've resorted to um, high accuracy, high resolution sort of CFD to get a better understanding. So this is looking down from the nose of the target This is some of the major uh, design changes. As I mentioned, uh, the main baffle coming down the driver side has been removed and replaced by a standalone bubbler. And the gas injection nozzles, which were right around the periphery the circumference of the circular cross-section, both have been removed. And there is provision for gas injection line directly. So just understanding how the energy deposition looks like, uh, there are several beam profiles to be considered. A uh, nominal beam is called the J-beam on the left. And the, the densities of energy are fairly similar within an order of magnitude, but the qualitative profile changes. When you go away from the nominal beam, you get the over-focused beam and the under-focused beam. The over-focused beam, you can see it's, a, it's more concentrated in the middle, and the under-focused beam has the larger spray 
uh, on the solid surface that goes almost to the top, the very top of the end of the curvature of the nose. Uh, on the solid side, this is easily predictable, but on the fluid side, this changes the location of the peak temperature because you have flow coming down through the window and flow coming down from the driver's sides. Uh, as a combination of this, the peak temperature is actually below the location of the peak temperature on the solid side. It's actually above and below. And there are several flow phenomena that contribute to where this location is and it may move uh, during the transient cooling pattern until you actually reach steady state. So looking at the front view from the nose, this is what you don't see much qualitative difference aside from the, the spread of the beam. And the peak values are fairly similar. They're between about three to five uh, megawatt per cubic meter. Uh, and the pump speed is controlled by the pump in the mercury process loop and nominal operations go from 250 to 400 RPM. Uh, this is just a cold flow simulation uh, without heat, heat transfer. And in 3D symmetry, if you, if you look at 250 and 350 RPM, one of the main differences that you start to see are the, the length of the vortex core, both down the driver's side, which is along the outer periphery, and then upon flow reversal, now we're only looking here at a horizontal cross section, but you have vertical flow reversal as well. So the combination of the two leads to this dead zone front, and that's not something that you want because there's a drastic drop in velocity due to bypass flow. What you want is some sort of turbulent lateral mixing, which you can see at 400 RPM and a little bit of 350 RPM, but not much. So in between the two is the metaphorical tipping point where uh, turbulent mixing takes over, and this is a good thing. And if you see the jump from 250 to 350 RPM, is uh, uh, creates a peak velocity increase inside this bubbler volume on the driver's side, and that sort of manifests in the vortex core, which elongates as you go along uh, down towards the nose. But then upon flow reversal, if you look at the four, 400 RPM flow rate, you start seeing the sort of vortex shedding like approach, which you don't see at 350, you just see a long vortex core. And this can severely affect your thermal predictions and removal of heat from the nose. Uh, to give you an idea of uh, why something like uh, the profile you see at 400 RPM is beneficial is from the turbulent intensity, which is normalized from the value at the inlet. Um, this is something you see uh, in vortex shedding applications. Uh, now, Von Karman vortex street is seen for lower Reynolds numbers. But over here, you have a sudden drop in velocity right along the floor reversal point, And that leads to a good lateral mixing profile as it leaves and almost down to the outlet of the domain. So a closer look at the bubbler and the benefit of the bubbler uh, requires the turbulence modeling along those wetted walls. And you have these sharp knife edges. And as you can see up here, if you can move that right here, you have a knife edge pattern. And even despite that, if you're able to keep the dimensionless wall coordinate, the wall Y plus below five, that's safe for brand space turbulence modeling. And uh, in designs like these, it is quite beneficial to look into large eddy simulations or at least attached eddy simulations because the impingement of the proton beam leads to sort of a shock wave propagation. And so acoustics become significant. And that's something that they're looking into right now. And we're also looking to develop a multi flux tool that can sort of in the same family of tools like ANSYS or Siemens uh, capture all these effects. So uh, just looking at turbulence and the impact of uh, vortex shedding like features, uh, this is a benefit because if you look at this figure down on the bottom right. On the upstream plane, just before the bubbler, you see a fairly uh, monotonous profile coming in. And uh, only because of slip near the walls, you see a very low velocity right next to it. But for lateral mixing, you want to improve those. It, you want to share the lateral profiles, which is why these bubblers have been introduced and you can see in the downstream plane that you're able to elongate those vortex cores just by looking at the cross section. And the enhanced lateral mixing is supposed to sustain longer until you hit the nose and then flow reversal takes over. And that's where the, the central baffle comes into play, where 
beyond flow reversal, you have lateral dissipation, which is what you see in the 400 RPN profile and as attested by the turbulence intensity as well. So with the nominal studies, we generally look at J, B, and E profiles. And then we also look at two other profiles. One is where the actual J beam is translated plus or minus six millimeters vertically. And these are generally studied for 350 RPM in nominal operation. You can see it when the beam is over-focused on the fluid side, these are the, the fluid walls, so to speak, but it's the wetted surfaces of the target. You see about a four degree rise in temperature. And for the under-focused beam, you see about a seven degree rise in peak temperature. But the location of these values changes depending on the wetting pattern and depending on the spread of the beam. So as long as they're within the operating range, uh, we're able to get a good idea of what the profile looks like on the inside. Now, again, this is just a horizontal view for representation, but it gives us a good idea of uh, how the local film heat transfer coefficient can be different right next to the nose, where, they form, where a constant value may be applicable, both downstream and upstream of the nose, and why it's important to actually simulate this in full detail uh, when solving conjugate heat transfer issues. Uh, a few other things we looked into were the effect of gas injection. And this is why you have provision for a gas line for bubbling or for actually forming a sort of insulated layer. And uh, while the gas is meant to improve mixing within the liquid phase, it also creates a sort of insulation on the top surface due to just basic density separation. So during the flow reversal, you have the momentum of mercury drive out through the middle, but then you would have the gas adhere to the top surface. So to simulate this and keep computational costs low, uh, one simple approach is to simply, simply insulate the surface and not have any conjugate heat transfer, assuming that the vapor will adhere to the top surface. Even in that case, you see about an eight degree difference in temperature on the solid side, because most of the residual heat is forced to resolve in gradients within the fluid itself. You see a higher fluid temperature, but you don't see that much manifestation on the solid side. So this is a sort of a consequence of the other studies which are more focused on gas injection and simulating microbubble formation and all of that. Based on those outcomes, it's uh, for, for basic target design studies, it's safe to just assume that there's no conjugate heat transfer to the top surface. So as part of the upgrade project, uh, going from one giga electron volt to 1.3 giga electron volts, we'll deposit another 300 watts, uh, 300 kilowatts of energy to going from 1.4 to 1.7 megawatts, and that's direct energy deposition. So with that, you see about a 40 to 50 degree rise in peak temperature on both the solid and fluid sides. But as expected, the qualitative profiles hold up, and you do see the peak temperature deposition. Uh, the peak energy deposition on the nose of the target along the line of symmetry. And this does not conform to the J, B, and E profiles that we have for the current beam. This is more of an empirical determination. Uh, and the CFD model has to actually be translated within the bounds of the, the spread of the beam. So this is something that needs to be validated in the near future, but that may happen in the next one or two years, depending on when. Uh, procurement and installation guidelines come in and when we have laboratory scale experiments to actually replicate some of these uh, geometric parameters. Uh, for a sense of scale, uh, we had to use about 640 cores, uh, which uh, with are all CPU cores, and that translates to about 32 cores per node on the CADES SHPC. The CADES is the compute and data environment for science uh, at Oak Ridge National Lab. And the SHBC is a scalable HVC. They have cloud systems. They have general CPU systems. Um, there's both an open side and a moderated side for calculations. So a lot of the Castle projects were run on the moderated side of KZS HBC, uh, among other systems. And of course, we have pre-processing, post-processing clusters as well, which have higher RAM per node, uh, if not as many cores. So uh, for pre, pre and post processing for animations, we use some of the local clusters in the nuclear energy and fuel cycle division, and they have up to 500 gigabytes of RAM per node. 
And of course, all the calculations were conducted in front of ECM Plus. So SNS also has an internal review system, and a lot of this is documented in design analysis and calculation documents called DAX. So there's a history of uh, target design um, being established through DAX for each of these designs, whether it was the jet flow system, the blue target, or the PPU target itself. Uh, moving on, so the target sits in the core vessel volume. And if you look at this figure, there's, it, it's just, um, a very complicated system. And generally analysis is segregated in by reflector plug. So you have the upper reflector plug, you have the intermediate reflector plugs, and then you have the lower reflector plug, which is where the beam sort of cuts through, uh, simply considered. But uh, prior studies have just sort of assumed, you know, for lack of computational insight, um, that the energy deposited by the beam in the core vessel volume was based on a simple uh, spherical volumetric heat source, which decayed as you went away from the center. And uh, the prior analysis has shown some values, but then for the PPU project, we need to show that the existing beam lines are capable of handling higher thermal loads. So uh, prior studies, and this is done about eight to 17 to 18 years ago, it assumed 3D symmetry, it assumed the spherical volumetric heat source, and the conjugate heat transfer problem was never simulated in full detail. So it, it assumed a constant film heat transfer coefficient. And just with the target for a system that small, if you can see the variation in uh, uh, film heat transfer coefficients and convective heat transfer coefficients in a matter of millimeters or centimeters, it's quite evident that you cannot assume just a single constant value for empirical calculations like these, where the temperature can range by 50 to 75 degrees in the space of a few inches. And that can have uh, surface effects on the flow of water. So you could have some evaporation, you could have near wall boiling, and you could have condensation all within the same loop. But those phenomena don't get accounted for unless you actually study them and then make a qualified assumption saying that it's insignificant before it's actually stated as an assumption. So the objective of the study was to actually obtain a thermal map of the core vessel, which includes several of these larger components and everything that's along the axis of the beam line, including the port windows, uh, the shielding structures, and the support structures, which go all the way up to the chimney. As part of the PPU project, these designs have to be requalified when uh, studying them computationally. So uh, the two main solid materials are stainless steel and carbon steel, which comprise the core vessel boundary, which you see outlined in red over here. And you have the proton beam window that cuts from, uh, the proton beam which cuts from left to right. And that's why we have the target port box and we actually have the proton beam window. So uh, you can actually visualize the beam cutting through it right across and in between you have this evacuated space. Uh, which is surrounded by stainless steel and carbon steel structures. Now, again, it, uh, all these solids don't have perfect thermal contact. As you can see right here by the laser pointer, you have an air gap, which we'll see in, in the following slides. But the air gaps pose a thermal resistance. Uh, some of the gaps actually are filled with helium, and some of the gaps between the stainless steel and carbon steel structures are actually air or exposed to atmosphere. So actually modeling those gaps is tedious because you're already looking at millions of cells to resolve the existing uh, conjugate heat transfer problem without looking at helium or air as additional volumes for fluids. And, uh, you know, it's been popularly documented in literature, uh, even for gaps in cladding, uh, generally a thermal resistance is simply imposed at the solid-solid interface to account for the presence of helium in the cladding or any inert gas. But this is something that you can do once it's been studied, at least at a fuel element level. Similarly, we have to study this at least once and make, uh, make it known that the presence of air or helium isn't a significant resistance to uh, the actual heat transfer map or the conduction. That's been accounted for in the study. So the solids close to the proton beam, we actually have good grid refinement and then moving away, we have uh, rapid cell growth rate, which is why we only have 
something like they drive 2 million cells for stainless steel and just about half of the cells for carbon steel because the carbon steel structures are on the outer, they form the outer annulus to the stainless steel structures. In the void spaces where heavy water flows, you have this convoluted uh, geometry that's extracted. So some of it is true piping, physical piping structures, but the rest of it is simply the flow of water between evacuated volumes between solids. And so the water literally finds its way and cools these structures between physical piping connections. If you look at the image on the right, uh, we have the sequence of one, two, three, four, five. One would actually be the inflow pipe and the inflow line where it goes through this uh, spherical annulus or circular annulus and empties into the bottom or the lower plenum of the core vessel cooling. And it flows uh, circumferentially, as you can see, you know, left and right along the base of the a lower plenum and then starts rising through these thin volumes into the pipe. Uh, but notably flowing through the proton beam window and actually cooling the ports over there is this uh, flow reversal pattern, which is intentionally done so. And the water finds its way through and there is piping only for connected structures at the end, but the rest of it is an evacuated space. And so there are a lot of uh, elbows and gaps that aren't actually physically modeled in the simulation, but we account for the curvature of the elbows because that can affect the frictional pressure drop, among other things. And then the, the flow is directed back towards the main plena, and then the flow comes back down and rises through these tubes, cools the port windows, rises to the top or the upper plenum where you see these holes. And so the flow emerges from there and then flows along the circumference towards the outlet pipe. And in conventional systems, you would probably have an, an in, a central inflow and a central outflow. So in that case, you would have an equal split of, heat, of coolant flowing along uh, the symmetry plane. But in this case, the inflow pipe is intentionally situated only on one side and the outflow pipe is intentionally only on the other. So the flow that comes out to the top plenum is forced to actually that traverse the entire upper plenum or the surface that, that it's based on before it actually flows out through the outlet pipe. So in cases like these, you have a circumferentially varying temperature profile at the same elevation. You also have an actually varying profile. And so it's dangerous to assume a film heat transfer coefficient, even though this is simulated at one atmosphere and uh, normal operating conditions. If you were to run this at higher pressure, then assuming a single heat transfer coefficient would not be a safe assumption. So th these are the, the other gaps in between the solid components which are comprised by air and helium, but for the sake of the study, it's just assumed to be of air. If you were to actually mesh those gaps, which we did in the, the detailed part of the study, you end up with 38 million additional cells. So this isn't something that can be run on a uh, simple workstation or even a small cluster because the total mesh size for the study was about 84 million cells. So the first study just ran it without air and then in the second study to assume the effect of air, air was actually modeled as a solid so that there's no flow equation solved on the inside and just constant thermal conductivity just to see the effect or how much energy was taken away by the air. But in doing so, we were able to quantify exactly um, uh, so uh, the general workload SNS is uh, you have neutronic type calculations, which give you a heat load, but then the heat load isn't mapped to the, the CAD domain. So the part of the CFC study is to first actually quantify what the energy deposition is in each of these structures. Because as you, as you can see, if you move away from the beam vertically and circumferentially, the heat starts decaying. So right off the bat, you can tell that using a spherical volumetric heat source, was not the right assumption. And um, also the magnitude of energy doesn't decay to an absolute zero. It, it can be extrapolated to zero, but it doesn't go down to zero. So there is some significant finite amount of heat that's always being deposited directly in the structures being considered. So by applying this function, we're able to quantify how much heat goes to every single component in those structures. 
And from a CAD model of initially more than 5,000 parts, the simplified CAD model had probably 150. So uh, it's a fast way to get you a fairly accurate answer. And this forms the basis for future CFD calculations. So once you know what the power density is, you could also do just, you know, say just a shielding analysis because you now have a complete thermal map of both fluid and solid temperatures and what the film heat transfer coefficients are around every single component. Here we go. I think there's a bit of a pause there. Uh, looking at hydraulic profiles of heavy water right through the core vessel, uh, you don't see much of a significant pressure drop, just over four PSI between inlet and outlet. However, uh, the, the constriction that's created by uh, the structures, which basically squeeze flow into the pipes and back out through the pipes, uh, you, what you have are several thin plano that are formed around the port windows, which are these evacuated places that you see in the shielding. And in between the port windows into this into the proton beam window and back out. So you don't expect to see uh, really turbulent flows or a lot of lateral mixing. You just want to see a steady motion of coolant being pushed through the system and out. So the peak velocities you see are less than two meters per second. And this is common for many um, uh, fusion-based systems as well, where the limiting velocity to avoid erosion inside like you see with uh, uh, tokamak systems or even with uh, jet in the UK or W7X, uh, two meters per second is the guiding peak velocity. So it's good to see in design terms. And this also gives you qualification for the PPU project where even with an increase in beam power, the structures are still fixed. So you still won't be able to generate higher velocities. It's important to quantify the design margin for temperature and make sure that you're far away from boiling and see how far you can get in the fluid side. Uh, two bounding cases uh, which are necessary to be simulated for design are nominal operation. And then through the, over the course of uh, operation, uh, the metals which get irradiated lose thermal conductivity. So for reduced thermal conductivity, we can through a case where there's a 20% reduction, which is significant enough. But luckily you don't see too much of a difference in you know, peak temperatures on the fluid side. Uh, you may see them on the wetted surfaces of the port windows, which are closest to uh, the energy deposition profile for the proton B. And beyond that, you see a, a fairly steady decay because a lot of the, there, there's sufficient enthalpy gradient within the heavy water to resolve and remove that heat. So some of the peak also point location values are not really along an entire surface or along an entire curve or edge. They're just local changes, which uh, manifest as peak values. Uh, however, if you see of heavy water coming in and leaving the system, so along the lower plenum, you see a smooth gradient develop. And as the coolant rises uh, and emanates through the upper plenum, once again, you see a fairly diffuse but constantly changing profile. Of temperature. So this is why one of the main goals of the study was to get a map of film heat transfer coefficients, which could simply be slapped onto a solid mechanics or structural model where this could be used directly instead of solving the entire conjugate heat transfer problem again, if there was a simple thermal change to one of the external solid structures. Uh, one of the good outcomes of the study was quantifying how much heat went to each of the port windows, which are not really symmetric. They're not really identical in structure. There are minor changes to the height and the width of each of the port windows. And each one comprises a set of three windows uh, where instrumentation is inserted uh, for diagnostics or for simple prognosis uh, during normal operation. But as you can see, the position of energy uh, even though the distribution is fairly symmetric around the proton beam, it's not the same. It ranges from anywhere from about 900 watts to about 1.25 kilowatts. So for a system of that scale, having access to the film heat transfer coefficients and the actual temperature distribution profile gives you a solid starting point to run 
a mechanical analysis or modal analysis as necessary. Uh, with reduced thermal conductivity, you do see about a 12 degree rise in peak temperature. And that's seen on the proton beam windows with the, the higher energy deposition. Also, the proximity of water is, is not, uh, the water is not in direct contact with the locations of those peak temperatures. But these are things, uh, these are, this is insight you can glean from CFD analysis, which you not necessarily can stay from looking at port windows, which are almost identical in structure, but some of them have direct contact with water, while others don't, especially on in the intermediate baffles. Uh, with the shielding, uh, shielding again is, uh, is, one of, is important from the viewpoint of water flow because the plenum is formed between the evacuated gap of the shielding and the upper plates and they aren't mechanically tethered to provide a flow path for water. The water sort of finds its way out through the holes uh, in the piping that's encased in the shielding. So once again, it's important because the shielding is the second largest structure to, or the, the second most significant thermal structure receiving 11 point, so it's just over 11 kilowatts of direct energy from the proton beam. The highest being about 16 kilowatts in the uh, target port bonds, the, uh, the proton beam window. So speaking of the proton beam window target port box, uh, the beam, uh, these first uh, sort of line of thermal contact through this proton beam window, which is why you see the highest energy deposition. And which is also why you have a convoluted flow network to enhance the residence time of heavy water inside and remove as much heat as possible. And as the beam cuts across the core vessel to the target port box, you see a drastic reduction in temperature because a lot of the heat has been removed and a lot of the heat has been deposited in the solids around them. So with good uh, wettability of the target port box, there's water flow above and inside the port box, which is why you see significantly lower temperatures. It's about uh, 22 degrees lower. And again, with reduced thermal conductivity, uh, having the same energy deposition from the beam, uh, you don't see a drastic rise. You see about a 10 degree rise in temperature for the proton beam window, but only about three to four degrees less in the target port box. So using this a component scale analysis is now possible in much higher resolution. So if there was any damage to one of the components, simply taking the heat load on the system and the film heat transfer coefficients, a quick mechanical study could be run within a day or 24 hours instead of spending months running a full, full blown conjugate heat transfer analysis. For sense of scale, this took about uh, 960 cores, which is 30 nodes on the KZS HPC. And every successful run took 72 hours. And of course, uh, when you have, uh, Cases where due to the complex nature of the geometry, you miss out on a thermal interface, which happened quite often, you realize that you have to go all the way back to the CAN model and imprint structures before you could generate the interface and have conformal mapping so that you have accurate heat transfer predictions and so on. So uh, the fine-tuned model with everything set up should a plug-and-play model will take about 72 hours to run on 960 cores for reference. Uh, the last topic I'm looking at for the SNS was predicting the transient event uh, in the mercury loop. As you saw before, the storage and drain tank is connected to the mercury process loop, which eventually feeds mercury to the target and brings mercury back as well. Uh, one of the events uh, which happened over two years ago was uh, there was a surge of helium, which was used in the process loop, and that caused some entrainment of mercury back into the gas line. So a quick study was to see how much mercury could be safely filled with helium above it. And if there was a surge event, uh, the, the surge pressure that's designed for the loop was at about 17 PSI. So if you had helium being forced down the surge line at 17 PSI, how do you predict how much mercury would be safe to be in the tanks to avoid entrainment as the gas went through? Uh, an initial estimate was between 20 and 40 inches based on volume. So we actually went back to the CFD model. And this is using the volume of fluid method, simple isothermal flow uh, with an ideal gas equation of state so that you're able to capture the work done by the ideal gas during compressibility. And in that case, you see 
uh, heavy sloshing because at 20 inches, the simple explanation is there isn't enough resistance from the mercury that's filled inside to actually impede the helium coming in. So in the initial transient, you actually do see uh, some of the mercury being entrained through the lines, and it, it happens in a matter of milliseconds, but it does happen. So moving on from there, uh, we look at 30 inches and all the way up to 40 inches. So at 30 inches, you begin to see that uh, there is sloshing again, but then there isn't as much entrainment, and it goes down to milligrams per second or less. And as you increase the, the height to about 35 inches and 38 inches, and 38 inches was really more as a safety check. But at 35 inches, you see that there's next to no entrainment or not even any uh, sputtering or splashing, which uh, in CFD speak actually are completely different phenomena, but to an operator or to the untrained eye might just be the same phenomena of uh, liquid being deflected by gas and being thrown up before it falls back down to the liquid level to the interface. So looking back at those scenarios at 30 inches, uh, again, we uh, there were effects that we didn't consider, but this was for a quick turnaround to get the process loop up and running again. And I actually have no idea what the value is right now in true operations, but this is an indicator of the balance. So the VOF model, uh, was successful, but there are drawbacks because uh, things like surface tension, which are important in cases like this. Uh, if you notice, we've only simulated the fluid volume, but uh, what you be taken into account is the material of construction for the storage tank, because that affects the surface tension and environment of any splashing or sputtering that happens uh, on the top surface. It also affects the uh, surface tension value at the bottom, which is mercury in contact with the solid surface. And the second would be the presence of any interfacial force and drag between helium and mercury, which has been considered. But if you look at the two-phase volume between mercury and helium, this is being overpredicted as a foam. And so there needs to be more of a review on uh, surface tension and interfacial effects between mercury and helium specifically to minimize the interface. Uh, as you would see with the initial condition, which is artificial because we're stating that both fluids are at peace with the zenithal fill height. So as sloshing ceases, you should revert to a more stable uh, interface between the two fluids. Of course, again, during the course of normal operation, it's not normal to give that much insight into the physics side when you need a quick response, when you need a quick answer to operators um, and things like that. So that's one of the drawbacks of doing intensive CFD and supporting uh, facilities. But when you're doing design like we did for the target system, uh, there's, all, there's a lot of uh, work that we've done that hasn't been shown in this presentation, but it's just to give an idea of how CFD can save the day uh, and give you quicker answers and uh, some of the trends now are to resort to reduced order models. One of the tools developed at the lab through the open modelical libraries is Transform. And uh, Transform, it gives you sort of a surrogate representation of a higher accuracy model, but that can be used for facilities and uh, plug and play efforts. And uh, that's something that we're trying to incorporate with new CFD projects is to is the development of a reduced order model at the end of it. And that's also instrumental in developing digital twins for facilities. So whether it's SNS or the, the high flux isotope reactor, uh, they all sort of fall in the same umbrella where facilities need intensive CFD analysis for, you know, for, for upgrades, for diagnostics, to actually understand interactions of multi-physics phenomena. But then also when resorting to uh, safety scenarios and qualifying new designs for retrofits, um, using reduced order models and digital twins can be very handy. And that's a lot of emphasis is being given to that currently in our division, in our directorate and at the lab in general. Uh, yeah, to, to run these simulations, uh, we were able to get away with uh, one node on our Libby cluster, which is in the new energy and fuel cycle division. 
It's our pre-processing post-processing cluster, but it's an absolute beast with 500 gigs of RAM per node. Uh, some of the benefits of having a lot of RAM per node are uh, you can run, depending on the type of problem, if your problem isn't grid intensive, but it's physics intensive, you need more RAM. But if you're solving a simple problem with a large eddy simulation on 25 million cells, uh, you're going to have to go to multiple nodes. And so there makes sense to use something like a CAD system that, like we do at the lab. And with uh, still quite a bit of RAM, like 192 gigabytes per node, uh, you end up using multiple nodes, but then you end up having to rely on uh, the MPI environment as well. So those are things to consider as your problem scales up in complexity and as you deal with multiple solvers, which may not scale at the same rate. So if you solve for multi-phase flow with a mixture equation or with the two fluid model, where you end up changing the number of equations being solved, the scalability and the, uh, uh, the message passing interface in the MPI environment may not scale at the same rate. And so even though you have the resources, you may not see the speed up necessarily. And this is something we see with reacting flow problems quite a bit. Uh, some of the other smaller projects that I've worked on uh, in the division are to support uh, molten salt related activities. Uh, we have a flow loop that's uh, run in Kevin Robb's energy systems and development group, um, which is also in the nuclear energy and fuel cycle division in the advanced reactor engineering and development section. Uh, but uh, that group is more uh, focused on experimental techniques and uh, measurement. And we, we go back and forth with some CFD activities. They also have CFD analysts, but if it's plug and play, uh, sometimes we help them out. And uh, uh, we get to work on other projects as well. So uh, including salt pump, this is from one of uh, the uh, non-lab projects which came to us. And they wanted to see uh, uh, if there was any entrainment of argon perched on top of the molten salt mixture uh at different fill heights so you know after a trial and error study we ended up with looking at about or in the range of about 20 inches and that's why the the depth of the pipes uh through circulation cuts off at about 20 inches and so the second one is at about 22 inches but when you have a pressure jump that's created by impellers you have a suction effect and so since the cross section changes along the depth of the pump uh, we wanted to simulate and verify that the, the sudden suction due to the change of cross-sectional area with the frontal flow area over here is not manifest with a uh, sloshing effect or suction of gas into the circulation line at the top. So uh, for comparison, uh, at 20 inches and at 22 inches, uh, you were expecting to see basically uh, where the difference in uh, purge gas manifests in, at the interface, at the sharp interface. And so this is where CFD gives you good insight. So looking at the volume of fluid model, again, like we saw with the uh, mercury and helium case at the mercury loop, uh, what you see here is the formation of a sort of foam. Um, or that's a loose term we've been using to an ill-refined interface. But in this case, it seems more justified simply because because uh, you have no pull of gas down into the discharge end of the pump and that's okay as a qualifying design. So if you were to go back and look at something that would be lower, you do see a bit of entrainment over here, but that's mostly gas that's getting pulled in, but it doesn't penetrate the entire depth of suction. It limits at this section. A lot of the geometry has been hidden because it's a proprietary geometry. But as you go up in uh, fill height, you see that the depth of gas penetration is a lot lower and it merely penetrates the interface which is well above the discharge section. So again, that gives you a good range of operation for uh, 
gas liquid systems or gas and molten fault systems. Uh, we also do a lot of CFD support for the material plasma exposure experiment. Uh, this is a uh, research oriented facility that came up from Proto MPEX. MPEX is the abbreviation. Proto MPEX was developed and ended, uh, I believe, earlier this year as a demonstration scale facility. And as, as a, and MPEX is the lead on from Proto MPEX. But with burning plasma, uh, you have plasma on the vacuum side, and then you have plasma facing components of several different materials, which are connected uh, to several different materials in both uh, number and size. It's a very multi-scale problem and solids are cooled by water in the air boundary, but the plasma facing components are in a vacuum boundary. And so there can be no contact with water. There can be absolutely no incidence of boiling and there can be no erosion. So that limits the use of water with many solids. And so this is something that we're working on and have been working on for the past couple of years, uh, very intensive on the CFD front, thermal mechanical analysis, and uh, also includes magnetohydrodynamics. But that's not something that we're looking to on the CFD side yet, but it definitely has an impact on the energy de deposited by the plasma. And uh, that's why none of the results are being presented from that project today. Uh, all the work that we're also looking at is the 17 by 17 full simulation of uh, turbulence in a normal uh, PWR fuel assembly. And uh, there's been a ton of work that's been published on the five by five and uh, similar scale of models. And a lot of the work has been validated with the, the flow loop work at Texas A&M, among other places. Uh, Star CCM Plus has been a big part of that tool and Star CCM Plus will also be used for this fuel assembly study. And some of this work was supposed to be presented at near at 19 in Brussels for next year, but we weren't able to get the work done. So this will probably show up at ANS uh, next year. Uh, third study where we're running uh, a fluid structure interaction of an integral, integral pressurizer unit, which is sort of a continuation from my doctoral work on the Westinghouse SMR, but is to actually run a full LES calculation uh, for flow impingement on the lower surface of a pressurizer plate and translate the impingement frequency into spatial scales uh, with a full power spectral density and use that to uh, solve displacements for the pressurizer plate in real time. Uh, using uh, discrete fluid body interactions. And all of that is expected to be run in Star CCM Plus and published in the next 12 to 14 months. So moving on to a more conventional process operations uh, with waste heat recovery. Uh, waste heat recovery is a big deal in really? any process. Yeah. Uh, can we speed it up? It's almost sure. five o'clock. Sorry. Sure, yeah. Uh, we've got process heat and uh, waste heat recovery systems. This is an HPC for manufacturing project. Uh, I'll, I'll go over pretty quick. Uh, we have a water pentane system. Pentane evaporates at 36 degrees Celsius. It doesn't require much preheating, etc. And we have water coming in uh, from waste loops at below 100 degrees Celsius. So we took a benchmark study for experimental measurements, which used water and pentane, reproduced it in the CFD study. And this is basically a direct contact heat exchanger where the fluids mix directly. And this is the evaporation front, which is characterized by an active length for the heat exchanger. We qualified this for all the simulated studies, uh, took the benchmark uh, volume of fluid model, established a threshold uh, volume fraction for the evaporating fluid at the interface. And we did uh, some isosurface analysis uh, to establish the active length as part of a verification validation study before we applied this to simulating the full direct contact heat exchanger. And so this is within the realm of operating in the low temperature realm. And we applied that to a few other designs using the exact same model. This is a design we came up with ourselves, but then we weren't able to evaporate all of the liquid pentane. So, you know, we're not able to achieve 100% vapor at the outlet. So we decided to go with a simpler design, ran into some cool phenomena 
It does look exciting, but are a tragedy for actual operations. And there was a simple fix. It was simply moving the liquid outlet away, staggering the outlet between the liquid and vapor. And because of that, we were able to simulate uh, two designs, one without the baffle, one with the baffle, and that shows you the mitigation of uh, shedding at the turbulent phase interface. And because of that, we're able to achieve about 12% superheat with uh, and without baffles. So this is published at Power, uh, ASME's Power 2020 last year. Uh, the third topic I was going to talk about was high temperature heat exchangers something that started two years ago as part of an RPE project, uh, maybe three years ago. And so we came up with these two banks, you know, arrays which are very computationally intensive, but meant for qualification using silicon carbide at uh, very high temperatures uh, above 800 degrees Celsius. We, we, after a lot of permutations uh, of flame tide design optimization, we came up with a very diffuse pattern. This is something very relevant to uh, subchannel flows as well. Uh, something you see with uh, mixing veins and flow upstream and downstream and the, the common issue leveraged a lot of that experience into designing the heat exchanger. And then we went into minimal surfaces. This is what's called the gyroid or the towards uh, G surface. And so we've uh, evolved that into a uh, gas to gas heat exchanger. This is just one of the fluid passes, but it's applicable for high temperature operation with silicon carbide at the wall. And we've done some unit cell design optimization, and we established a thermal map of uh, benefit of you know uh, compromise on pressure drop versus benefit on heat transfer. So we're able to hit the 20 to 30 kilowatt range, and now we're looking at topology optimization, which is by varying the force equation, which generates the basic surface of the gyroid. And this is something that we're running even today as we speak, and we're using several tools to achieve that. And that's continuing. Uh, and so we're also trying to adapt that into reacting flows. This is another HPC project we finished with uh, Gopher Resource. They're a large secondary lead refiner in North America. But this is a complex system with oxyphil combustion of you know, natural gas, which is highly exothermic. We have pyrochemical degradation of solid feed, which is endothermic. You have elements, of mostly metals, which melt. You also have some alloy type materials, which can melt and then continue to react. We also have products which melt and react and diffusion of gases through the interface. This is a paper we just got published for uh, REWAS 2022 next year at TMS, but it's uh, sort of a first of its kind study that does uh, oxyfuel combustion, solid decomposition as heterogeneous chemical reactions and melting of lead all in a single simulation. Uh, the last of the animations that are here to show the use of the discrete element method in uh, predicting in replicating furnace operations. So we're able to inject uh, close to a million particles to be simulated in real time at the end of the cycle. And as the particles get injected, they flow downstream, they get consumed. And as you can see above, you have uh, what's called a burden form, pyrometallurgical term. It continues to melt and then the melt pool is uh, removed and we're supposed to characterize the, the diffusion of gases through the melt phase and then in back into the flue gas phase so it's a fairly complex project we're very cpu intensive and uh, we're hoping to get phase two funding through the uh, hbc for manufacturing project but that's that's it yeah i know i had a lot to cram into the talk and i'd be happy to take any questions Let's see. So mm. thank you, thank you, Yuno. Um, I think we run over time. So uh, is there a question here from the audience? I can I think is there something from the chat model? Um no, I don't see anything on the chat. So but thank you very much. It was very interesting and informative uh, presentation. So I will encourage sure, yeah. everyone to uh, follow up an email uh, if you have questions. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to take questions over email. Okay, thank you very much again. And uh, hope next time we'll see you in person. Yeah. Thanks. Hopefully, yeah. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Vivek.